Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Lovely. We are going to take just a few minutes to let people come into our episode today. It's a beautiful day outside. If you've had a chance to go out and about just for a brief, brief little walk during your workday or something. Yes, yes. I am actually currently in Massachusetts. I'm in my mother's kitchen. Um, and they have not yet gotten spring quite. There's just a little bit of buds uh, on the trees and things like that. But coming from Tennessee up here, I was like, hey, where's spring? Um, so this is this is great for me to kind of like reinfuse my life um, with spring. And I wore my very pollinator friendly um, shirt just for this episode. So y'all are welcome. <laughs> the closest I got was little earrings that are pine cones. I won't get too close to the camera so you can see, but that was my little nod. I don't have I don't have beer, bee earrings, but I think I think that's something I need to fix, clearly. Yeah. yeah. Pine cones are just good enough. <laughs> Close enough, right? <laughs> Close enough. Wonderful. Earthy. Wonderful. Yeah, exactly. Oh man. Well, we actually have uh, quite a few folks already on board, so I think we might be ready to ready to start. All right. Well, welcome to today's show, everyone. Uh, we are so excited for this uh, buzzing conversation, nudge, nudge. Uh, we are very <laughs> excited to have Carol Taylor with, uh, she's the president of the Master Gardeners of Davidson County and Ian Daw, the secretary of the Nashville Area Beekeepers Association and co-founder of We Are the Honey Collective. And we are uh, going to be learning about the importance of bees and how we can support a wider community of pollinators here in Nashville. Sustainable in the City, as a reminder, is a partnership program between Zero Waste Nashville, my organization, and Urban Green Lab, Christina's organization. Um, my name is Ali Omens, and I'm the Zero Waste Program Coordinator for uh, our Zero Waste Nashville team. And I'm here with Christina, the Assistant Director of Classrooms uh, for Urban Green Lab. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Allie. And as a reminder for folks who are either joining us for the first time, welcome, or just need a little refresher, um, we now use the Q&A function um, for our questions to our wonderful guests. So if you have any questions um, buzzing in your brain that you want to ask um, these wonderful folks, please make sure you put that in the Q&A section. Um, what is very exciting is that you can actually upvote the question. So in case we are inundated with a ton of questions and we can only answer some of them, um, if you upvote those questions, Questions, we will be sure to answer those, um, but we do do everything in our power to ask um, all of those questions um, to make sure that you are being heard. Um, and we also ask you to use the chat to kind of chat amongst yourselves and, and maybe share resources that you think are pertinent, um, but just kind of keeping the, the conversation going. And so as always, we like to ask a little fun question to get to know y'all and also make sure that you're using the chat correctly. So please make sure you set it to everyone, set the chat to everyone and let us know how do you feel about bees? These are polarizing little critters. Are you afraid of them? Do you love them? Or do you maybe just need to learn more about them before you can even have an opinion? How do you feel about bees? I'm seeing Michael saying, love them, love them. I love bees. They scare me a little bit, <laughs> but they definitely, uh, they, they are wonderful little things that I can't wait to learn more about. I hope we can keep you from being so afraid. Yes, yeah. yes. I just want to. I want to. I want to be realistic. That some folks don't just come out and, and love bees. They they need to. They need to learn a little bit more about them to lower their defenses and and to realize that these are wonderful creatures um, that are helping us thrive um, as a as an ecosystem. So I think that is everything that we need to know about the chat and the Q and A. Keep your love them, hate them, fear them, want to learn more about them, um, and and we'll be excited to see that. Um, keep keep the chat going um, as much as you want. And like I said, please make sure you're putting your questions in that Q&A section for Ian and Carol, and we will make sure that those are heard. And then we have some really exciting events because it's Earth Month. Oh, yeah, this is so exciting. So we have so much to talk about. Allie's going to run through most of these, and then I'll hop in um, with one of the end. So Allie, take it away. Yeah, super quick, just here at the top of the episode. This week has been Tennessee's Food Waste Awareness Week, and it's not over yet. It's only Wednesday, so there is still time to spend this week thinking about food waste, thinking about ways that we can reduce how much we are sending, um, how much waste we're sending to landfill. Right now, a fourth of what we here in Nashville send to landfill is food waste, 
And while one in nine Nashvillians are food insecure, this really makes this issue, um, it should be very top of mind for all of us. And as part of Food Waste Awareness Week, uh, one of the happenings going on is that my organization is hosting a webinar this Friday at 11 a.m. to talk about the dirt on composting. It's a uh, you know, tips and tricks for backyard composting, a really hyper local way to reduce your, your food waste to landfill. And you can register for that on at nashville.gov. We will also send all of these resources and events in a follow-up email. Uh, this Saturday, there is a bread to tap event from 1 to 3 p.m. at Jack Love Brewing Company, where you can learn about food waste reduction. And uh, also there will be beer made from unsold bread, apparently. So that's exciting. And my team will have a booth there. So come see Zero Waste Nashville at that event. And you may even win a fun prize for engaging with us. We'll see. Uh, and then as Christina mentioned, this is Earth Month, uh, which culminates in Earth Day. Uh, but the week leading up to Earth Day, uh, my organization will be hosting a recycling facility tour and talks event on Wednesday, April 19th. Uh, from 1 to, or from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., there are a bunch of different slots you can sign up for in that time to take a facility uh, or a tour of Nashville's recycling facility. Uh, and that is co-hosted by our organization and waste management, our contractor. And then finally, Earth Day. And that event is co-hosted by Christina's organization. So I will give her just a sec to, to talk about that. Yeah, so many fun events. I hope y'all will take advantage of those. And the, the most fun of all, the culminating event on April 22nd, um, basically all day in Centennial Park will be our um, Nashville Earth Day. And so this is a free event. This is great for all ages. It's great if you want to spend the whole day, if you want to pop in and pop out, maybe get some food, talk to some local nonprofits, government agencies, um, other folks and vendors who are working to, to help our community and help this planet. Um, it's going to be a really, really fun day. Um, we're, we're proud of this and, and we really hope that you'll, you'll come by. So it's free, it's fun, and it's in the sun. So, so wear your sunscreen, come on down, see some bees, see some friends, um, and, and rock and roll with us. But now we're going to learn more about bees. So you know what to do for the rest of the month. You have fun activities that you're going to be so excited about that we will send all of that information in the follow-up email, but you came today for bees. So let's get into it. Great. Agreed. All right, Carol, you want to take us away? Sure. So let's see, I already have it pulled up here. All right, so bees. And so pollinators, I should say the title of this is pollinators and pollinators are more than just bees. So I don't want to um, give that uh, misunderstanding, but we're going to talk about bees and I'm going to let Ian focus on honeybees that everybody uh, is most familiar with and I'm going to talk just briefly I'm not going to read all these slides. Um, these are available to you if you wish to have a copy um, either they can attach that or we can zip it or or you can email me and we'll get you a copy. Um, okay let's see I know what I did there we go. So Bees, both wild and managed, that is those that are in those hives, um, like the honeybees, are really going down in uh, population because of both pesticide use and changes in the way we use our land. So we're building, and I don't need to tell anybody in Nashville how much we're building, but that's a, a serious problem um, for a lot of uh, our bees, and particularly the native bees, because they have different nesting needs than um, what you might imagine or think about automatically for honeybees. And we need to try to figure out ways to provide habitats and food for these creatures. And you're probably familiar with the saying, and I think it's pretty accurate that about one of every three bites of food we eat um, have been pollinated in some form by um, bees. And most crops that are fruit, meat, nuts, seeds, fiber, hay, so even feeding our livestock, we need pollination by insects. And they're also very important for our, na our native plants um, to make sure that they can keep flowering and growing. By far the uh, main insect pollinators are bees. We also have uh, butterflies, uh, birds, and so forth. 
But the um, European honeybees are the best known and they are typically um, managed pollinators, but there's hundreds of species of native bees. And so down here in the images below, we have some of our most popular um, characters. They're good because they spend their life collecting pollen, which is their protein source. So you're used to reading your labels on food. Hopefully you read your labels when you're at the grocery store to see the protein and the carbohydrates and fats and so forth. Pollen is where the bees are gonna get their protein and fats. And the nectar is where they're gonna get their carbohydrates. Bees are good pollinators because they tend to focus on one kind of flower at a time, which means that they drop in, pick up some pollen, go to visit another of the same kind, and then transfer that um, pollen to create seeds. And the nectar is just a sort of bonus that the plants have created to be a, uh, an enticement for the bees, but it also provides the bees with their water and their sugars. So most of our native bee species actually have nests in the soil. So as we're losing our um, soil, our plant cover, um, we are losing our habitats for our bees to grow the next generation. So the more we pave, the more we build, we're losing that. Um, and that's where we're losing a lot of our population. Other bees don't dig in the soil, but they use plants. So they either bore a hole in there and plant and put their eggs in the stem or in the wood, or they take over old homes that used to be part of uh, beetles or other existing cavities. Bumblebees actually have often been found to be in abandoned rodent um, burrows. And then wild honeybees can also nest in tree hollows. I had an exciting summer one year where they took up residence in one of my trees um, along my driveway. That was really cool to watch. They um, take care of their nest cells using some sort of material that they produce, usually some sort of waxy material. Others use leaves or resin, or they can also use um, uh, masonry to close up the cells in which they lay their eggs. A lot of bees are solitary and then they only make one generation of bees per year. So they lay their eggs, that series of eggs goes through their um, life cycle, become uh, pupa, little cocoons, and then they wait until the next year to come out. Other kinds uh, may have multiple generations in a year. So those that have multiple generations need to have food for the whole season so that they can have a strong colony. It's not really a, I shouldn't call it a colony for solitary bees, but a strong population. Um, and so we want to provide plants that overlap with their blooming period to help them survive. I already mentioned this, that pollen is the source of protein for bees and some uh, plants have higher protein levels in their pollen. And so those are preferred plants for bees. They want to go where it's the richest food, you know, so they want to be strong and get the most they can from every stop. The pollen is going to be where they also get their fats and a lot of their minerals. Nectar is their main source of carbohydrates, as I mentioned. And nectar is produced in plant, in flowers predominantly, in glands called nectaries. Um, other areas of plants can also produce nectar, which is kind of an interesting thing. That's a different talk. Um, but this is why the bees will kind of crawl in there. If you can see my arrow, they'll crawl in there and to try to get down to the nectar, which will cause them to have to bump across the pollen and carry that pollen on them. So they get covered up. Uh, with pollen sometimes. Flowers that bees like uh, tend to have fragrance that's a sweet and light fragrance. And the color patterns are also uh, not necessarily the ones we see. You can see in the bottom, um, the colors that the bees see is a different area of the spectrum. And so the plants look very different, and, or the flowers look very different. And it's very interesting to me that 
they have this sort of landing pad where they can say, okay, there's the area of the flower and let's target that center. Here's the area of the flower, let's target the center. And so uh, the evolution of the flowers has uh, taken on the colors that the bees can see because the flowers benefit so much from that. So I'm going to look at a couple of specific bees really briefly. I don't want to, I really prefer to answer questions than to lecture. So I'm going to go kind of quickly through these. Um, of those uh, native bees, about 30% nest in cavities. So either hollow plant stems or in holes in wood. And like I said, you can get this copy of the slide. So you don't need to um, look specifically at those. But if you see a stem, this is a stem from a rose where a bee has um, hollowed it out. And you can see there are little larvae and there's the pollen that the bee has packed in there. And there's a separation between each of these cells where the bees are. And I can tell from this, um, the direction that the hole, the main hole is to the left of the screen, because the bee, the mother bee will pack the cell with um, pollen. And some bees make something that's called bee bread for food for their larva, they'll lay an egg the egg will hatch and the larva will then eat that pollen. It will stay in there and then become a, uh, or pupate and become a, a cocoon. Down here, you can see some cocoons in the stem and some more cells. It's a little bit dark. And this is a leaf cutter. So you can see those are coated with leaves. I think we have some better pictures, here we go. So these are the pupa, pupated, they're turned into cocoons. And these are cells, they're harder to discern each individual cell when it's a leaf cutting bee because they wrap each of the cells with uh, leaves. And then there's a bee called a resin bee. And rather than using um, mud or leaves, they actually create a resin or collect a resin and make a little cell for each of their larvae. Um, there's mason bees. Um, they typically uh, pollinate about 95% of the flowers that they visit. So they have a very short life cycle and they're very important in a lot of orchards um, to uh, pollinate fruit trees. So here's some of those cute little mason bees and they're, they're kind of tiny. Here's one very industriously carrying a big mouthful of mud to build a wall. Uh, between uh, cells where she's going to be laying her eggs. And they're really pretty bees, I think. This is um, called a blue orchard uh, mason bee, and it's blue. And they're quite um, endearing. They don't have honey to protect, so they're not likely to sting. Um, they will sting if you um, get them caught in your shirt or in your hand, but the sting is pretty mild, it doesn't, um, I'm not saying it's not gonna cause allergy uh, reaction to somebody, I don't know that, but it's not as um, terribly itchy as some of the other uh, bee stings that you might've had or like I've had in the past. Um, there are about 242 species of leaf cutting bees. Most of them are solitary. Some are in small col colonies. And here you can uh, see specify what a single uh, nest would look like. And personally, I think it's very hard to see where the next <laughs> individual one would be. Uh, some leaf cutting bees actually uh, have their um, nests underground. And so these are some of the leaf cutting bees. Here's how you can tell if you might have leaf cutting bees in your neighborhood. They actually cut a little semicircle in the leaf, they use their little trompers and chew that up and then they carry, they actually fly with that piece of leaf back to their nest. I mentioned the resin bee before, um, they will use uh, tree resin or small stones uh, to create their cells and they're usually uh, waterproof so they can actually lay in um, some unprotected spaces sometimes. So here's uh, resin bee chambers. Uh, here's a nest 
plugged with little tiny stones and resin. Now, carpenter bees, people really get irritated by carpenter bees because they have been noted to sometimes chew a hole into your um, uh, picnic table or your deck. Um, important to know they look a lot like bumblebees, but they're not the bumblebees. Carpenter bees also have a bad reputation because they are uh, known for robbing the flower of its nectar. So I'm gonna show you the robbery. <laughs> So sometimes they can chew a little hole. And, and so they're not kind of gonna do their pollinating job, but they get their nectar and they move on. They actually will put their brood into holes in wood that they've, um, they can dig and create. Um, and they have much larger larvae. I wanna do a quick side by side because the bumblebees they do the pollinating, they don't tend to rob the nectar. So a big difference for you to be able to tell, and these are not scaled to size, but the carpenter bee has a shiny rear end, if you will. <laughs> and the uh, bumblebee has a hairy um, thorax, uh, ab let's see, that's the tail end. So the abdomen, all right. So that's a quick way to tell which one you have. And uh, carpenter bees, you can encourage to go elsewhere, make it easy for them, provide holes for them already made elsewhere, and that, that can help protect your, your deck rather than um, spraying uh, pesticides, which could hurt all of them. Other bees, 70% 70, 70 of those native bees are gonna nest in the ground, and so, they're sometimes hard to see where they might be. Um, here's a, what I was talking about before, that bee bread, a little collection of pollen. There's a tiny little larva there ready to eat. Uh, bumblebees are some of those ground nesting bees. They're very active, um, even in cooler weather um, uh, than and, uh, other bees. And they will fly even when it's very windy and they're, active on cloudy, foggy, and rainy days. So there's our bumblebee friends. There are uh, four different kinds uh, here shown from across the US, uh, Eastern and Western areas. And you can see they will warn you rather than sting you. So um, they will actually raise their middle leg and sort of wave to says back off. And this one's probably reacting to the camera or the human breath, they don't like that. Um, and so that will tell you, okay, you're too close, get away. The bumblebee nest in the ground, uh, this is what it looks like. So it's actually a, a bunch of little uh, containers they call honey pots. They're made of wax and they store food. Uh, some of them store food and some of them have the bee larva. Solitary ground nesting bees usually are in a, a bare sunny spot that's not likely to be flooded. Um, and they start digging and that can take several days. They'll make a long tunnel and then they'll go uh, and lay their eggs. This will show you kind of their brood chamber. So they will dig down and then make a few separate spots for each of their eggs. Some of those are the green sweat bee. People are irritated by sweat bees a lot, but they're just there for the salt and the liquid. They're not gonna sting you. They're just not interested. Um, they might feel funny on you, but they're okay. Um, squash bees, uh, known for uh, pr pollinating squashes and gourds, but they do a lot of other things as well. Um, let's see, cellophane bees are interesting because they um, actually make a fungicide and bactericide that is uh, in their uh, nest that protects their um, larva. And it's called a cellophane bee because that's what their nest really looks like. It looks like a little piece of cellophane that they have their egg in. I'm just gonna go. Quickly. Okay, so the rest of this is just some ideas for planting 
planting uh, native plants, which the bees have evolved with, planting a diversity of when the flowers will bloom, um, plant some perennials, but also plant annuals. They love trees. Don't forget trees, and probably right now a lot of people are dealing with the pollen and allergies from the trees, but trees also provide for um, our bees. Provide a bunch of colors. Different bees will like different colors. Um, red flowers are more for butterflies and hummingbirds, but mix it all up, get them all in there, bring everybody. And it's nice, it looks good too if you plant in masses, groups of plants. So we have bees that are on the decline. We need pollinators. We need to have good food amounts and good qualities. Uh, so it's in, good, it's in everyone's interest to try to help those bees and uh, particularly those native bees who are losing out on a lot of their locations. So I went a little bit fast because I wanna make sure um, there's a chance for Ian to share and to get questions. Thank you so much, Carol. And Ian, before you get started, I did want to ask um, if Carol, you could tell us just a little bit about how you how you got started in in working with bees. Why you kind of found that work for yourself? Why you're passionate about that? Just to yeah. kind of time us on that. So um, because I love to garden, and I went through the master gardener uh, training so I could volunteer with the UT Extension. And as I'm growing my vegetables and herbs, it only made sense to look at the whole environment. So not just the plants, but the soil, the water and the bees that would take care of those uh, plants for pollinating. And so it's really clear that we need to do a lot to help those uh, populations kind of rebound. Um, so we actually have a program of bee farming within the master gardeners. Uh, we're gonna probably try to develop that so we can have some more outreach. So um, this is native bee farming, a uh, lot less intensity than what <laughs> Ian does with the honeybees, but um, hopefully we can help create some more population with um, that process. Thanks, Carol. It's just always interesting to hear how people, you know, how we all find our passions as we, yeah. as we do. And then Ian, same question to you. And then if you want to share some of your, your great photos with us. Oh, you're, you're muted. Happens to all of us. Yes, thank you. Um, great slides, Carol. Thank you. Um, I will add my passion. I was a gardener for long, much longer than I've been a beekeeper. And I think Carol and I are the same when I was starting to garden, um, bringing in pollinators, to help with my crops. And then just having flowers, native flowers, when I was growing my native plants back in England, having the life come into my yard, into the garden, I just found it absolutely beautiful. Um, I, I loved it. And then just seeing how the, the micro ecosystem evolved in a small area, just a quarter acre plot. And like I have here in Nashville, I live in East Nashville, just a mile from the stadium. I have about 50 species of American native plants in my garden. And the life around me is just phenomenal, highly varied, lots of bees and butterflies and bats. And I just love to see the life. Um, and yes, I do have four um, hives in my yard. So that's very busy. The honeybee is different than the native bees. They live in a super organism of approximately 60,000 bees per hive. So it's much, much bigger. And they they need to be foraging all year round. Um, bee lat lives for about 40 days in its lifetime. So the queen is constantly laying eggs to keep the hive alive all year round. Whereas the, a lot of the solitary native bees, as Carol said, they will come out and be around for just a month or so. And they specialize in feeding on certain plants. One I'd like to just, mention one thing Carol touched on is the loss of land that we're facing. Um, here in East Nashville particularly, the, the builders, the developers are allowed to build these tall skinnies and taking away the gardens of the house that was there previously. Um, and it's, they're allowed to do this under the, under the laws of the state. So I think we need to find somehow making our metro leaders 
somehow accountable for part of the reason why we're losing some of the land. Lots of trees are being cut down and trees are very important. A tree in supply of nectar and pollen is about the same as one acre of flowers. So a tree is highly important. And a lot of trees like the oak tree supports approximately 180 species of insect. So that's, I'd just like to touch on those items. Getting back to the honeybee, um, yes, they are an introduced species of bee and they have been brought over from Europe and Eastern Europe and um, we, we breed them, look after them um, specially. They, they are very useful in pollinating crops and they are moved by some beekeepers, not me and not some of my co-compatriots, but they are used for pollinating some of our crops like the almond crops in California. They do help um, pollinate a lot of our crops as well. I find that a lot of people who are, don't have the knowledge about pollinators, the first thing they'll meet is a beekeeper at a show or a trade. And I find that beekeeping is a good segue for people to get to know what's happening in the world, especially for those people who are not gardeners, who are not realizing what's happening in, in the micro ecosystems. So beekeeping is a good segue to introduce people to gardening in a, in a wider sense and what's happening to our pollinators because they realize that the first thing people hear is we need to look after the bees. Yes, we do need to look after the honeybees, but as a side, as a positive um, note to that, all of our native pollinators will also be looked after and cared for. So let me see if I can sh um, sh just show you. Carol had some extremely good slides. I'll see if I can get a couple of. Um... Um, sorry. The... Okay, you can't see that. No, sorry. Um, I'm having problems getting. Oh, here we go. Right. We can see it. Yep. Perfect. Yes. So the, the honeybee is in many ways substantially different to a lot of the native bees. Um, and even within the species of honeybee, there are, there are differences, some darker, some lighter bodies. They, honeybees differ in that they, when the honeybee is foraging, a honeybee will find one species of flower to forage on per foraging session, rather than hop between different species of plants. So a honeybee needs to find a field of a particular plant or a larger area of a particular plant or a tree. And here in Middle Tennessee, the tulip poplar is about to bloom. And that, um, when honeybees find that and native pollinators, the increase in foraging will be immense. And that is a superb nectar source for the um, honeybee. This, this honeybee I'm showing you here is on a button bush, um, button flower. And I do that in some large swathes in my garden. It's a lovely um, annual plant and the honeybees adore that along with other native plants as well. The, um, sorry, let's see if I can get another, another photo up. With, um, sorry, that's the same one again, sorry. Um, I think what I will, um, my slides are not. No worries, and Ian, we can just run through some questions that um, ah, may, yeah. sorry, may help Prime as well. Absolutely, yes, yep. yeah. So, uh, a friend sent me this lovely photo of a native um, flower that blooms at this moment in Middle Tennessee, the Virginia bluebell. And as you can see, the honeybee is love, love foraging on that. 
a great collector for the honeybee for um, pollens and nectars. Um, some plants provide nectar and pollen, some plants only provide pollen, like St John's wort supplies only pollen, which as Carol said to all species of bee, honeybee and native, is used to make bee bread a, a food for their young. I think um, just at the moment, I'm thinking of what else I can add because Carol's, Carol's um, presentation was superb and I'm... Well, Ian, you've kind of touched on this um, a little bit in mentioning, I mean, you both have in mentioning native bees and honeybees and mm -hmm. kind of drawing the similarities and, and differences between those. Could you just touch on that a little bit more, um, and specifically as your work doing uh, small scale beekeeping here in in Nashville? Yes. So through Nashville Beekeepers, we do a lot of stands at various shows and fairs. And again, as I said, a lot of people come to, come to us and see us, and it's a good segue. Meeting beekeepers is a good segue to an introduction to the wider world of pollinators and gardening and I'm glad to find also that a lot of beekeepers used to be only a beekeeper and a lot of gardeners were not beekeepers but I'm finding that there's a lot of people now who are crossing over into both disciplines and a lot of beekeepers are becoming more extensive gardeners and a lot of gardeners are becoming beekeepers or if not beekeepers for honeybees, being more aware of what our native pollinators require, such as not disturbing the ground so as not to destroy the ground nesting natives. My wife grows a lot of ornamental roses and we, we have a lot of leaf cutter bees take chunks out of the leaves, but we accept that. We just know that's the leaf cutter bee loves that but all of our her roses have circles cut out of the leaves and um, part of life in our garden. That's, that's the way we, we welcome that. And we're very happy with that, that it's happening. Those and sometimes it's- Ian, are good because you know, it's not a disease or anything. It's just yeah. helping. They're building their nest. The leaf cutter bee is building their nest using the cutouts from my wife's roses. So we're, we're more than happy. And I think sometimes the worry is when people want everything looking absolutely perfect. You might have, you know, my, my wife roses at the end of the season do not look absolutely perfect because their leaves have been cut up by the leaf cutter bee, but they are still healthy plants. It has not harmed them in a long-term way. And I think we need to sometimes educate people that you might lose a plant, you might lose a plant, um, but educate people in, well, what's acceptable and what should be happening in the wider world of pollinators, along with honeybees. Yeah, and, and that's a great example of even just helping people understand that process, because someone may think that they're, that rose bush had a disease or something, something's wrong, when really there's nothing wrong. It's just nature doing its thing. That's right. And one of my funny to-goes is when people say they fear a swarm. Ironically, honeybees are at their friendliest when they're in a swarm. Their, their bellies are full of honey. The only thing they're looking for, when you see them hanging on a tree with 30,000 bees, the only thing they're looking for is a new home to settle into. They are not interested in anything else. And honeybees do not want to sting you. That's the last thing they want to do. They just want to get on with um, foraging and, um, and as a cross and, po and uh, pollinating, they do not. The only time they will sting is if you do go into their hive to interrupt them. And that's why beekeepers obviously wear suits. No. Ian, what should we do if we saw a swarm like in, in your neighborhood? Yes, um, if you don't know a local beekeeper, then go on to the Nashville area beekeepers website. There is a list of people there who you can phone and they will hopefully, if they've got time hopefully come out and collect that swarm beekeepers do love catching swarms it's um it's 
swarming is a natural instinct. Bees want to do it. They're going to do it. It's increase of the species. Instead of having one hive, they've now got two. So it's survival of the species. And to a beekeeper, it's another hive or another colony of free bees, which they can use. Um, so yes, call, call your local beekeeper um, or send an email. If you get bees inside a structure, that is a bit more problematic. You do need to find a beekeeper who knows how to take structures apart and put them back together again. Mm. But otherwise, if you see a, a swarm on a, um, on a tree limb, call your local beekeeper and the Nashville Area Beekeepers website has that list. Do, do the, um, the, what do you call them, the pest managers call you guys when they find a, a swarm in a house oh. or something? Thankfully, a lot of them do. They're, they're, they are becoming more aware of how important honeybees are and the fact that people are getting more sensitive towards pesticide use. Um, the, a lot of them will, yes, phone, phone us. And we do get a lot of calls from the pesticide company saying, hey, there's some honeybees here. Do you want to come down and collect them before we are spraying, mm -hmm. which is good. And then, of course, it's educating people not to be using pesticides anyway. I don't want to put the companies out of business, but it's nice to see that in my area of East Nashville, it's very, very rare to see a lawn care company, especially coming around. Whereas when I was working in Belmead, it's the, the lawn care companies, they were around all the time. And there's virtually no life in those, in those yards. Um, have to say uh, it's, it's it's part of education and helping people know what they can expect and what to accept in your in your yard like for example my wife and me we accept the damage done to her roses it's part of what nature is doing educating people towards that does Nashville area beekeepers teach people how to keep bees or is it just sort of a, a club? Yeah. yeah, we do. We have one, maybe two courses per year. They take about one and a half, maybe two days. Um, and it's an intensive beginners course. But then following up from that is we have a list of beekeepers who are prepared to be mentors because the first year of beekeeping and the second year to a degree is a very, very steep learning curve. You can do a lot of reading, a lot of studying, but the actual hands-on experience, as a lot of my mentors will explain, is makes a big difference as to how successful you are as a beekeeper. The joke is you can ask two beekeepers the same question, you get six different answers. <laughs> um, so, but yes, and they will they will support new beekeepers. And and the and the cooperative I formed, the honey cooperative, that's one of our main goals is to support beekeepers in maintaining healthy productive hives but also for the benefit of the honeybee not just so that we can get lots of honey we do that but we also make sure that our honeybees are healthy by leaving lots of their food on the hive at the end of the year as well their honey which they've produced themselves and then taking that further going back to the native bee is leave the leaves um, I might scoop some of my leaves off my very small lawn. I have a lawn which is about 100 square feet and just push it into flower beds. Um, I tend not to get rid of my leaves at all. It's leave the leaves. A lot of moths require overwintering in a pile of leaves and then emerge in the spring or early summer. So they need those leaves as cover and then food in the spring. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, sorry, I'm just piling on the questions. You can ask, you can ask any of the other questions, <laughs> Ellie, but I was wondering, Ian, um, the, there's not a lot of native bee habitat like in the downtown corridor, you know, but mm. honeybees, you can put some hives up, but what are their food sources? And I know like, I think the Hermitage, if I'm not mistaken, Her Hermitage Hotel has bees on the roof. Um, I don't know if it's on the Hermitage, but um, on like yes, on the, one of the big hotels they do, and they have provided um, a, a a lawn, a flowering lawn, 
with some short growing herbs in um, for so I think about six hives. But the Hermitage Hotel does have their own hives out at Glen Levin, just oh, right, off right. 65. So then they use that as a great um, teaching resource for school children. They go along, put some suits on and have a look at how hives are managed. Um, and that's that's a great thing because a beekeeper will, will the, at every beekeeper's meeting, they will talk about what's in bloom now and what's about to bloom soon because beekeepers need to know that to manage hives successfully. So beekeepers are very good at knowing what's about to bloom and what's good for their honeybees. And I'm finding that um, beekeepers know that the wider population of pollinators is benefited as well. Mm -hmm. That's good. Are there? Do you think there's enough trees downtown for the honeybees and uh, that are sort of maintained down there? Um, just about yes. Um, I am worried about the 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 ever reducing tree canopy here in Nashville. And again, going back to what I was saying earlier, the law in Metro Nashville allows for keep trees to be cut down very easily without any permission. Some cities like Atlanta have a tree commission mm -hmm. and they a developer has to have permission to cut down any tree that's over 25 years old and they save a lot of trees that way. And I think Nashville should, could hopefully do much the same, but certainly downtown Nashville, the tree canopy is thinning very dramatically. There is a, um, a volunteer organization called We Love Trees or Nashville Loves Trees, and they are helping people to plant smaller trees along uh, roadside borders again, which is a good thing. And in addition to, go ahead. I was just gonna say, in addition to um, tree canopy being reduced downtown, um, we're often seeing, and I know there was an earlier Sustainable in the City episode about this, about the connection between um, urban tree canopy and um, our communities of color and lower income communities in Nashville and, and across the US, um, that pattern. And is that something that that you all see in your work that you know you have different communities that basically have different experiences um, in having pollinators just around their, their neighborhoods? I'll address that, yes. I moved here to East Nashville 10 years ago and the developers are moving in and taking one plot of land which housed one family unit with a garden, a yard and garden, and knocking down the house and one large tall skinny with no garden at all is being built. And again, it's, it's down to the fact that this is allowed to happen, which I think is a, is a great shame. The number of family units in Nashville is being reduced and at the same time, green areas are being reduced greatly due to partly due to gentrification. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, there are groups like Root Nashville that are trying to get trees put up in, in a lot of places, but it's just the, you know, where is there not cement? <laughs> I mean, there's certainly got to be enough places, you know, we don't even have sidewalks in my neighborhood, so we don't have a ed sidewalk edge to put a tree in or anything. So it's um, it's sometimes very difficult to find a spot to put that tree. And like you said earlier, trees are fantastic because they have so much um, flowering at, at a particular time. It, it takes care of a lot of, of our pollinators. Um, and, and just as a side note, I'm a We've got two trees which shadow our house and it just helps reduce the, the burden on the air conditioning. Um, but going back to the original question, I think areas like East Nashville here, mm -hmm. which was generally a, an, an area for low income and people of color, it's the gentrification is, is altering that dramatically and sometimes not for the better. And the, the low income families, you could say lived much more in, um, sympathetically with the with the environment because they were not interested in having everything looking perfect and perfectly green like a perfectly green lawn with no weeds in it there's there's a, my lawn's tiny but I've still got a few weeds in it and the the, the low-income families they're, they're they're 
they're not interested in in the look of the perfect lawn and that's another thing i'd love to sort of try and persuade people don't have the perfect green lawn allow some short growing weeds or herbs to growing it and that's that's that would be a great achievement if we could have more people worrying less about just the appearance and actual worrying about the substance of the lawn and what's growing in their yard and are you all familiar with a no mow month that Cumberland River Com did I steal your line Carol <laughs> that, I was just gonna say my my husband loves that <laughs> yeah uh my household is doing no mow month uh but Cumberland River Compact is uh they've passed around signs that that people can put in their yards if they're participating and agreeing not to mow uh, during the entire month of April. And of course, there's part of Metro Code that requires that grass not grow higher than 12 inches. Um, but I think there's some attempted flexibility around that if you are displaying your sign. Um, but that kind of segues me into uh, just one last question before we turn it over to all of the many great questions that we are having in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> and this was, was asked in the Q&A as well. Um, that I saw someone in the audience asked, but how can we support our pollinators by, um, you know, plant, what specifically can we plant in our yards? What, um, like you all mentioned, not mowing as much or allowing those weeds to grow. Um, what are some of those other tips and tricks that you can share with our, our audience? I think, if I just may, I think the use of the word weed is overused very <laughs> often. Um, I'm allowing to grow a weed called Miami mist in a few of my flower borders it's a native it grows to about 12 16 inches tall and when you're driving along the road if you see a swath of light blue flowers it's probably miami mist great for pollinators it's a beautiful color and i just allow it to reseed itself to spray to flower in the spring um plants that you can plant the pollinator partnership website has a superb web um, resource for finding out a list and it's a very extensive list of what plants are native to your eco region um, and if you have a look at the pollinator partnership you can find a whole list and then and they've got pictures of each plant the growing conditions whether it requires sun shade damp or dry soils and then you can decide which one of those you would like to plant and then where to obtain the plants Grow Wild here in Middle Tennessee is a superb site for, for purchasing plants. Further afield, Prairie Moon Nursery and Prairie Nursery are very good as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I think those are great resources. Double check some of these though, because sometimes they'll say native plants, um, but native to where? You know, if, the, if, the, if they send their catalog to the whole country, you know, double check just for yourself and checking that website that Ian mentioned is a great um, start because then you'll know what's for our area because we, we don't want to plant something that's native to Oregon necessarily, you know, that we don't, uh, that we don't have. So um, that's a good resource. Natives are best because our native um, bees and honeybees are most familiar with the natives uh, and they will grow and uh, with each other through the seasons and and that makes the most sense and, and also when you're walking around i use an, an app called iNaturalist on my phone if you don't know what a flower is take a photo the iNaturalist and also seek will identify the flower for you and, and then you can find out is it if it's a flower you particularly like you can obtain it for your garden and you don't have to start out with converting your whole yard to wildflowers, just decide, okay, I'm gonna try this. Let's just try six different species of plant and say one border or two borders. I've got some shady plants in a, in a in sh moist shade and I've got some in bright sunlight. So different species of plants survive in both. And you could just decide to just try two or three small areas of your yard. You don't have to devote the whole area. But if every, or if most households had just a small patch of native plants, it would change the neighborhood immeasurably. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Thank you both. And Christina, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to get through some of our audience questions. Since I, so I know we have so many and I've seen a lot of great resources shared by the audience in the chat. So be sure to check those out as well. 
Yes, for sure. This has been a fabulous conversation to be listening in on. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, so I did I did dismiss some of the questions um, that were about um, kind of the best uh, plants to have. Um, so there was one question, though, that I just thought was an interestingly specific question. Um, are there any plants that have the highest protein? That's a great one. I don't know, Ian, do you? I, we could do some research on that, but I don't know. Yeah, that is off the top of my head. Um, that That's a good one. I Immediately, the tree, um, the linden, the tulip poplar is just exceptional. And I think I heard somebody mention um, the bee balm and the bergamot. They are mm. very, very good. And mountain mint. Um, when I plant when I, my patches of mountain mint have bees and native pollinators all over that plant and all, you can I think you can tell what plants are particularly good because pollinators of all varieties are very good at deciding which plants are the best for themselves you can have two or three species of plants in an area and you might notice that only certain plants are being visited in preference over some other plants that makes sense. So you kind of you get a little you get a little uh, tip off from where they're yeah. hanging out. And yeah. so we actually had a, a kind of a similar question um, from Christine, who is saying that she had so many flower, um, so many bees on her flowering peppermint last year. Um, and she's just curious if you all know what type of bee um, particularly likes that peppermint flower. I've, I've never known honeybees visit that, um, but I'm. I'm Yes, it's not one that I'm, I've ever seen on a, when we're talking to honeybee um, beekeepers, we do give them a list of, here's a list of plants, native and non-native, to put in your garden, which are great for attracting honeybees. I've never seen that on any list. Mm. So I'll, I'll, def, I'll search that one out. That might be interesting to see what I can find. Yeah, I, I've seen tons of tiny bees on, on my mints. And just as an aside, We've talked about pollinators, but there are also beneficial predatory insects, little wasps and things that also feed on these. And I call them predatory because they eat the bad guy insects that might be at your vegetables and so forth, or, or they, you know, they take care of those populations. And they like tiny flowers that have sort of an open face. Here's my hand. <laughs> so they can sort of get in there and get uh, that. And I think that's the nature of those uh, flowers on the mint and a lot of herbs have those smaller flowers, buck, buckwheat, um, those kind of things. You can plant for those beneficial, we call them beneficial, they may not particularly be pollinators, but they're beneficial in the sense of getting rid of some of the other bad guys like and aphids and stuff. Mm -hmm. And on that, my wife's um, peach trees were being mauled by the <laughs> oriental um, moth so we put we planted yarrow which attracts an insect which then predates on the oriental moth so there's ways of without using a pesticide to kill everything there's ways of finding how you can deal with something that is a pest yeah and i really appreciate this conversation just for kind of the holistic view that we're taking of kind of let nature do what it knows how to do and and using it and and not kind of again what, what Ian was saying kind of looking for that that perfect lawn or that that perfect kind of ideal version of what um, your yard should look like and and really just kind of letting things letting things be I think a lot of what sustainability is is kind of remembering and coming back to what we all know uh, that that really actually it looks better too it, it's more fun to see life and to to see flowers so I just really appreciate the fact that we kind of keep coming. Um, back to that point. We are coming up on the hour. So I just want to say thank you um, and goodbye to anybody who has to hop off for the last 15 minutes um, because their lunch break is over. Um, but we're going to keep rolling with these last questions. And just a reminder that if you have asked any questions in the chat, to please put them in the Q&A. That's the only way that we can kind of keep them straight. Um, and so I'm only asking questions from the Q&A section. So get those in there if you have any last minute questions. I mean, we do have some more to go through. Um, and so you, you have touched on this and Honestly, I should probably know this, but we've been talking about pesticides being harmful for bees. 
I am unsure if the word herbicide is the same as pesticide. So someone actually asked, are herbicides um, harmful to bees in Nashville? And so I just wanted to give you space um, if there was more nuance to that question at all. I would say if you are putting a poison on a plant, then you are poisoning the insects that are feeding on that plant for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you're taking away their potential food source. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure there's lots of things about getting into the water system as well. I mean, but honestly, I would put an herbicide on poison ivy or, you know, <laughs> something particularly noxious. So I don't mean to say that it's, but but direct application or very tight application and a, and a proper timing, following the label, all of those things, you know, so, yeah. Yes, rather than just broad spraying an area. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're going to move a little bit into hives because there's quite a few questions on the hives. Um, and so we we have some questions about just can you talk about keeping bees in hives a little bit more? Um, and then there's a specific question of where have you had the most success with keeping hives and how many hives do you currently maintain, Ian? Right. Here in my house in East Nashville, as I said, I live about a mile from the stadium, quarter acre plot. I've got four hives in my backyard and I get for myself about 60 pounds per hive of honey. And that leaves that still leaves the hive, each hive with about 30 to 40 pounds for themselves. So they're very successful. And I maintain um, about a dozen hives over in Pegram for a landowner. Um, it's it's a. It's about trying to ensure that your hives are healthy, not feeding them artificial feeds and looking after them as naturally as possible. You can manage them swarming, but you can't stop them necessarily because they want to swarm. They are going to swarm. That's what they want to do. It's in their instinct. Um, t t learning beekeeping is, is joyous. It is a solitary um, adventure. Um, you tend not to go out in groups to look after your hives. You do it alone. Um, and it can be nice if you've got company, admittedly. But generally, when you're looking after your hives, you're doing it. And yes, I visit some friends who are mentor mentees to help them manage their hives. But once they're on their feet, they might call me for a question, but they'll be doing it themselves. Beekeeping is, tends, tends to be a solitary um, activity at the time yeah we do meet socially mm. and and I apologize if you brought this up already Ian but because I was watching the Q&A so sometimes I miss things um mm. but how long or how much of your day or week um is spent tending to these hives so you're saying it's solitary activity but the company mm. can be nice so I'm assuming it's not just you go out for a minute um yeah. so what does that kind of look like so I'll, tomorrow morning I plan to go out to my four hives that will take me just over an hour and the other day when i visited three apries belonging to some landowners it took me all day to visit about 16 hives mm. so it, it's and we're traveling around so it, it's it's if you want to be a backyard beekeeper and just maintain two hives you might need to devote say two hours per week mm. and that's that's all even even if the heaviest time is now during the swarm season where you need to get in and inspect your hives for swarm pr preparation um but even then it's just a couple of hours a week at most you can do it so it's not it's not an everyday occurrence it's it's leave them be as much as possible actually okay great so it's kind of solitary for them as well. Yes. Um, and then we have um, actually a beekeeper in the audience um, asking how far and why do bees stray from their hive um, to get the pollen and nectar? And they said that, oh, I'm becoming a beekeeper and worry all the time about whether or not my bees will find what they need. That they will find it somehow. Here in Middle Tennessee, the dearth is late summer. And then in the fall, when the goldenrod is is blooming then they can start gathering again but bees used to um forage in three miles in every direction leave the hive three miles but with the loss of land the loss of foraging opportunities it's found that bees now have to forage out to five miles to mm -hmm. find enough food which is worrying because then they're not producing as much honey as they could otherwise 
um, and then the life of their energy. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And so again, if anybody has any lingering questions or feel like their their question was not answered because it was in the chat, put it in the Q and A because we actually only have one question left, um, and then we'll we'll let our folks um, let us know if there's anything else that they want to share. Um, but we do have a question. We're you know we're not allowed to. Um, kind of say to go buy honey from a specific place or anything like that. But if someone does want to find your honey um, at the Honey Cooperative, do you have um, a website and, and that's what we should be sharing? Or is there any other way that you want folks to find you? Yes, yeah. at the moment, the honey, the honey Cooperative, we've got um, farmers market stands at East Nashville Farmers Market and Amkey Station Farmers Market. We are out of stock at the moment. I will be doing an extraction in a couple of weeks. But you can certainly come along and find a local beekeeper at virtually every farmer's market that's around the area in Nashville. Maybe not us, but there will be a local beekeeper. Our website, we are the Honey Collective. Um, you can set up a CSA, a community mm -hmm. share as well, um, to buy your honey on a bi-monthly basis or monthly basis. Um, and also then at... Again, the Nashville Area Beekeepers website, there is a list of beekeepers who sell their honey. And I think people are learning you know, very well that local honey, um, honey that is resourced responsibly by beekeepers is much more beneficial than a lot of these mass produced honeys, yeah. which mm -hmm. probably are cut with yes. other items. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And then there's something also with like, if it's, seasonal and it's local doesn't it also help kind of like our immune system and it's just this whole kind of again the, that holistic system yes because you are consuming pollens which are captured from your local ecosystem you are possibly building up immunities to um, allergies yes that's awesome and then we did have a, a last minute question come in um if you could just talk about the cost of setting up a hive um, kind mm -hmm. of getting the boxes and the suits. Like, what does that look like if we're actually going to make this uh, journey into beekeeping? Yes. We, we beekeepers recommend you have two hives um, to start with. So you can compare if a hive is weak or strong, you can compare two side by side. For everything you need to start hives in your first year, you need to spend about $800 to $900. And then most of that is reusable equipment year on year. And then after that, maybe a hundred dollars per year after that. I might have some beekeepers laughing and spitting their tea out because it is it can be an expensive hobby. Um, but once you get your equipment together, you you can reuse the frames that you get the honey from, store them well, they're used again next year. Your costs, your annual costs are minimal, but about eight hundred to nine hundred dollars for everything you need in the first year and then join your local association, find yourself a mentor to, to, to find out, to, to ask questions. That's the important thing. You can do all the studying, but once you're actually in your hives, the bees doing whatever they fancy doing, they do their own thing. Great, I appreciate that. And that was a very um, practical question. So thank you for asking that. Um, and, and again, I apologize, Carol, if you mentioned this, but um, it would be interesting to hear um, your opinion on the Master Gardener program and folks getting involved in that. And if there's anything you want to share about that process. Sure, um, so Master Gardeners, um, we have a lot of different projects and gardens and in the Davidson County area. And each county has their own group of Master Gardeners. Um, Master Gardener, I should say, I got into it because I thought that was a credential that I was going to be, you know, have this certificate as a master. It's a, <laughs> it's not. It's a volunteer organization, and you are certified now to work as a volunteer for the extension um, at University of Tennessee or uh, T TSU. Mm -hmm. um, they have, both are required to have outreach to the community to teach people about horticulture. So we do a lot with the libraries and the seed exchange program. So if you want to plant some of those natives, you can go to the library and get free seeds. You can check them out. There's no fee if you don't turn them back in. <laughs> There's no late fee. <laughs> so you can get those and plant some um, herbs, vegetables, um, flowers, blooming flowers, all those kind of things. Um, 
So our, our website is MG, stands for Master Gardener of OF, DC for Davidson County, mgofdc.org. And um, you can see our schedule, uh, different events we have going on. Uh, we do uh, Ask Master Gardener tables. We're going to be at uh, Warner Park, I believe, this weekend. And uh, Warner Park is having a big nature day on, I think it's the 29th. I don't have my calendar in front of me. I'm going from memory. <laughs> so double check me. Look at the website. Um, but um, we'll have uh, people out there that can talk about insects, that can talk about plants, that can talk about uh, soils, um, all of those things that work all together. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> oh, it did completely. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. And just a reminder um, for folks still on the call that I will be sending the follow-up email within the next day or two, and that will have everything that we're, we're talking about today and, and um, ways that you can find um, all of this information. And I always like to ask um, Ian and Carol, is it okay if I put your emails onto the follow-up um, email so that folks can actually reach out to you? I have I have a question on here that I think might be a little bit um, too specific to get into the last second um, of, of this episode, um, talking about kind of how to prepare the next colony for next year. So Ian, if you think you can answer that in just a second, um, otherwise maybe uh, they could reach out to you directly to get that ad advice. <laughs> yes, that is a multi, multi-layered um, yes. answer. But, but when you take off the honey that you want, start with leaving at least 40 pounds of honey for, for the bees themselves to consume of their own honey. That will mm. keep them much healthier than you feeding them sugar water as a substitute to honey. That's that's the thin answer. Yes. I can go into a lot of detail, yes, when I'm talking to a beekeeper about that. That's a whole lecture. <laughs> Wonderful. So I'll put, I'll put those emails on there. Go ahead, Carol. Let me just throw in that um, Ian mentioned the dearth of food sources in our hot, hot summer. So mm -hmm. To help your pollinators get out there and don't put out sugar water, but water your plants. Mm. Uh, your weeds will, will bloom, <laughs> you know, all of your uh, good plants that will provide them food. So that's don't rain on top of them, try to water from the bottom. <laughs> um, but you don't want to cook your plants, but um, that's going to be one thing that can help. And besides, that will help your, your yard look look good too. That's wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. We are just about at time. And I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity to wrap up this conversation. Um, I have learned a lot and also just got super excited to get back to Tennessee and see all these wonderful pollinators doing their spring thing. Um, so make sure you come visit us at Earth Day and do all those great things with Food Waste Awareness Week. Um, go hang out with Allie and, and learn more about uh, MRFs and, and recycling and all those good things. Um, and those will all be sent out in the follow-up email. Um, but, but again, thank you so much, Ian. Thank you so much, Carol. And thank you everyone for, for watching and learning more about bees and our, and our pollinators and how to keep them healthy and happy. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. We'll be back Thanks. with you next month. Bye. Bye, everyone.